I've written a book called uh, Chaos and Caliphate, which is an attempt to bring together and explain the great upsurge of wars, violence in the Middle East and North Africa, which is one of the trends of our era. Uh, there are now eight wars going on between Pakistan and Nigeria, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, other countries being torn apart by raging civil conflict, sometimes sectarian, sometimes regional, in all cases collapse of the state, often foreign intervention, sometimes by regional powers like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Gatter, sometimes by foreign powers, Western powers like the US and uh, Britain and France. But whatever the exact ingredients, the outcome has generally been chaos and the one uh, group or series of groups that have benefited have been extreme uh, Sunni fundamentalist groups like Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and of course Islamic State. Um, it's been quite a long process uh, before we reach the present cataclysm. And it's only recently, I think, that people have begun to appreciate that it is a cataclysm. After all, in 2003, the overthrow of Saddam Hussein was greeted by much of the uh, Western uh, population, by America and in Britain. People often like to forget this now. But at the time, they thought the great dictator is gone, secular democracy will rule. Uh, in fact, exactly the opposite happened. Again, in 2011, with the start of the Arab Spring, optimism reigned supreme again for about six months to a year um, in places like Libya, Bahrain, Syria, uh, Egypt, of course, Yemen, uh, Tunisia. But again, only Tunisia has something of a democracy left. In all these other countries, we've had uh, wars uh, most of which are still going on. And this book is an attempt to explain why this has happened, to bring this together. And it does this in a particular way. I reported most of these wars uh, on the ground, and certainly the, the most significant ones to my mind. Afghanistan in 2001, the invasion, and of course in later years, Iraq from 2003, which is a country I've known very well for since the 1970s. Um, Syria, um, and still involved in this uh, uh, endless civil conflict, and Libya. Um, and the book has what I hope is vivid eyewitness reporting of the wars and conflicts in these countries. Uh, and uh, it, but that is interleaved with chapters of analysis and reflection on what these different conflicts in very different countries have in common, which is a great deal. Uh, um, and to try and bring it together. Uh, I've done it that way because I think that contemporary reporting has a credibility which retrospective reporting does not, that it is, uh, I hope, generally eyewitness. Uh, even when I've talked to somebody and got information from them, it's something that they've just seen. There is a reason to believe that they know what was happening. Um, otherwise, I think you write a book that combines rep even things you saw, but basically regurgitated with the knowledge of subsequent events. It loses uh, credibility um, and uh, it loses its sense of the way uh, events 
really unfolded. There's another reason for doing it this way, that in general I, I took a different stance than many uh, uh, reporters on what was happening at that time. I, I suppose you could call this war reporting. I don't really like the word because it has some macho overtones. But um, the problem about war reporting is that the melodrama tends to dominate everything else you see on television. Big bangs as the missile lands or a tank explodes or uh, anti-aircraft fire in the air. And um, that dominates the news agenda. It's not that it's untrue and it's not that it's not important. But there are other things going on, uh, political events. Uh, just to sort of quickly go through where I would differ from others, for instance, in Afghanistan in the early stages. And I was in northern Afghanistan from soon after 9-11. I'd been based in Moscow and I'd uh, come down across the border into uh, uh, the Hindu Kush in uh, northern Afghanistan. It was... Um, to me that actually there wasn't much of a war. It may seem a very simple point to make, but it's very important. On television and elsewhere, it looked like the Taliban was defeated. We saw all these bombs coming down. Um, but in fact, most of the Taliban gave up. They went home. They were ordered to go home. Uh, their withdrawal, their retreat, was pretty orderly. I drove at one point down from mountains in the north to Kabul, then I went from Kabul to Kandahar in the south. And uh, I kept on thinking, am, am I missing the fighting? But actually there wasn't much fighting. They went home. Now why was this important? Was it meant they hadn't really been defeated in the sense that the Japanese or the Germans were defeated in World War II. And they were saying at an early stage, unless we, if people come after us, if everybody, uh, if we're persecuted, then we'll go back to war. And that's very much what happened. But it wasn't quite how it was reported at the time, um, when it seemed like a great big war with a clear result. And certainly not just television watchers, but in Washington and London, they thought the Taliban is beat, no need to include these guys in any subsequent distribution of power. And that, of course, was disastrous, because these represented a significant constituency in Afghanistan try to exclude them, and they'll fight. Somewhat similar situation in Iraq. Uh, of course, a lot of people were killed in 2003 in the invasion. But most of the Iraqi army went home. In the north, uh, actually very little fighting. In the south, a bit more. Uh, as a consequence, you had an Iraqi army which hadn't really been beaten, which went home, uh, and then they discovered that if you were a member of the Ba'ath Party, something you had to do to get a job, even as a taxi driver, uh, didn't mean a great political commitment, that you were excluded from any employment in future. You had officers, generals, who just didn't, not only lost their jobs in the army when the army was dissolved, they lost their pensions. So I remember meeting lots of officers who were selling their furniture to feed their children. Now, of course, there was an alternative for them, which was that they joined the resistance or became part of the resistance. So you had highly trained officers who were doing this. It was a catastrophic decision. But it wasn't necessarily, again, it's quite simple to begin, that there wasn't the great big victory which Bush and Blair declared. And you could find that. I remember coming down from the north, and on the road you could see Iraqi tanks. And they'd been hit from the air, and I thought maybe they'd been um, destroyed from the air. But actually, it was a slightly different story. They'd been abandoned before they were hit. I went and looked inside. You could see they'd been abandoned. Later, they were hit from the air. That meant the Iraqi army had just gone home. Um, and I was always a, pe uh, I don't know if you'd call it a pessimist or not, but I always thought as soon as the US and others decide to occupy Iraq, this will end badly. They might just got away with the invasion if they just got out, because Saddam Hussein had been a disastrous leader over Iraq. But instead, they occupied the country. Invasion and occupation, a bit different. Uh, and occupation was going to be resisted by most Iraqis, and it was also going to get support from outside, from Iran, from Syria. Because at that stage, the Americans were saying very arrogantly, uh, Baghdad today, Damascus, Tehran tomorrow. You say that sort of thing, uh, you're going to provoke resistance. So it was pretty obvious how the Iranian-Syrian regimes were going to react. 
a uh, similar thing happened in Syria after 2011. Libya, I always, I was in Benghazi, later in Tripoli, and it was evident that the rebels really weren't that strong. Uh, they could hold their own, their popularity, particularly in the east of the country, but they were going to lose unless they had massive support from NATO. In fact, it really became a sort of NATO war on the front line. Uh, and again, it may not have been obvious from media coverage that there were more journalists south of this town called Ajdabiya, just outside Ajdabiya, uh, which in turn is south of Benghazi. There were more journalists there than there were rebel fighters, uh, cameramen, Western cameramen, would ask the journalists to get out of the way so they'd get a clear shot of the rebels with their Kalashnikovs and their pickups with heavy machine guns in the back. So it looked as though there was a sort of massive force there. There wasn't. And most of the fighting was done by NATO and done from the air. Now, this had a consequence, uh, which was that um, when Gaddafi fell, he hadn't really been overthrown by Libyans. This isn't an argument in favor of Gaddafi, it's just what happened. And there's always a danger in journalism that explanation will be confused with justification. But it is just a fact that Gaddafi would not have fallen without uh, foreign intervention. Um, therefore, there was a vacuum with his fall and a disintegration of authority. And that vacuum was increasingly filled by Islamists, in extreme Islamists, and um, uh, jihadis, including now Islamic State. But it was, it was pretty Islamist from the beginning. One of the first things that happened when the new transitional government came to Tripoli after the death of Gaddafi in 2011 was that they declared that polygamy was legal again, which had been banned by Gaddafi. You know, not something you'd think would be a priority for an incoming provisional government, but that's one of the first things they said. It wasn't very widely reported, but it did give a sense of what was going to happen. Syria, the most important, um, and perhaps the most misreported, to my mind, that there was a romanticization of the rebels. Um, and this was a popular uprising to begin with against a police state. And ba President Bashar al-Assad runs a police state, a very brutal police state. Um, but the rebels, first of all, from the beginning, it was a sectarian uh, uprising. It was primarily Sunni. There are about six Sunni Arabs, about 60% of the Syrians. That tended to be understated. And already in Syria, the first, maybe the first six months, first year, local forces predominated. But for the next three years or so, it was the regional backers, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, Iran, were the predominant influences. That's rather changed now. The US and Russia are the main influences. It's been internationalized. And maybe this is good. I think it is good, because it means that you have what are, in Middle East terms, superpowers uh, who have influence over both sides. So we do have a temporary, uh, fragile ceasefire in much of the country. It may not last, it isn't everywhere in the country, but it means a lot of people are alive who would have died otherwise. Um, I thought from early on, and this was expressed in various uh, articles that I wrote in at the time, that Assad simply wasn't going to fall. There are 14 Syrian provincial capitals in one to when people had said in 2012 he's going to fall, he held all 14 of them. He lost two over the following years and had most of the populated areas. Uh, the Syrian war, perception of it is sort of engulfed by propaganda, government propaganda, propaganda organizations, atrocity stories on the uh, um, 
all over the social media. Um, and some of them true, uh, some exaggerated, some false. A friend of mine uh, in southeast Turkey came across some uh, Sunni Arab boys, 10 year, 12 years old, uh, refugees, and they're watching on a, a laptop a, a film video of what claimed on in subtitles to be Alawites, the ruling uh, sect in Syria, uh, murdering our Sunni Arabs, Syrians, uh, by cutting off their heads with chainsaws. So horrific stuff. But actually my friend recognized it, that this film had originally been made in Mexico, and it was real, but it was a Mexican drug lord uh, intimidating his uh, rivals by uh, cutting off the heads of uh, opposing gangsters. So that does give the flavor of, the, of, the, of these atrocities. And these atrocities are everywhere on the social media. And of course, Islamic State deliberately stages them and fills them, films them to intimidate its enemies. This, of course, fuels hatred the whole time. Um, the book doesn't have a solution. Uh, to this, but it does try to bring these wars together to explain what happened, what they have in common. Uh, it does stress how foreign intervention of all kinds has invariably either provoked or exacerbated violence, and pretty well nowhere has succeeded in ending it. Think of what happened in Afghanistan when British and American troops went in, um, that now they're largely out again, but the war goes on uh, and is in some ways more intense than ever. But I think that I would like to think that this is the, the first big book which brings together what I think of as the age of jihad. Thanks very much.